Oh, hi there. Today, we're gonna talk about lost video games. And video games are tricky for the lost media community because even if we have video footage of a canceled or lost game, that doesn't mean it's entirely found. Until we get our hands on the game's files, we can't comb through the data to find everything the game has to offer. Because leaked games aren't necessarily legal, there very well could be playable builds of some of the games on this list in the dark corners of the internet. So if you know where they are, let me know in the comments or on Twitter at Lost Media Mike. So here are 10 lost video games. Guillermo del Toro is one of my favorite filmmakers, and as someone who's been following his career since the mid-2000s, one of the major frustrations with del Toro is his tendency to announce projects prematurely. This man has announced so many projects only for them to get cancelled partway through development, he has his own Wikipedia page on just that topic. I've almost gotten used to being disappointed, but some of the most frustrating unrealized projects of Guillermo del Toro are his failed video game adaptations. The most high profile being Silent Hills. I've already talked about Silent Hills before, but I can't stress how maddening this is. The game's publisher, Konami, decides to disrespect Hideo Kojima by removing him from the Metal Gear franchise, leaving Metal Gear Solid 5 unfinished, cancelling Silent Hills, removing the demo from online stores, only to drop a Silent Hill pachinko machine months later, then releasing the horrendous Metal Gear Survive. While this is the cancelled Del Toro game everyone knows about, he has two other unrealized video games, Sundown by Terminal Reality, which never made it into development, and Insane, which actually has a large amount of lost and unreleased content. Announced in 2010, Insane was a multi-platform game being developed by Saints Row creators THQ with Del Toro as director. The game was announced at the 2010 Spike Video Game Awards with an expected release date of 2013, intending the game to be the first part of a trilogy with potential for a multimedia franchise. The game was a first-person horror adventure taking cues from The Thing and the Cthulhu mythos with all the body horror and mind-melting visuals to go along with it. For example, the climax of the first game was to involve taking down a monster as big as a mountain with a train full of explosives. The game's development was plagued with technical issues in trying to achieve the horror aesthetic Del Toro wanted, and the project was eventually scrapped when THQ filed for bankruptcy in 2012. Based on a 2018 Game Informer interview with the developers of the game, there is a large amount of content from Insane that is yet to surface, but all that we have from the project is a few character models and a 30 second trailer that basically tells us nothing. After the failure of Silent Hills, Del Toro said, I've proven to be the albatross of video games. I joined THQ and THQ goes broke. I joined Kojima and Kojima leaves Konami because Metal Gear. I've decided, in order not to destroy anyone else's life, I've decided I will never again get involved in video games. Around the same time Terminal Reality was working on Sundown with Guillermo del Toro, they were also working on another collaboration, this time with author and director Clive Barker, best known for writing the horror classics Candyman and Hellraiser, a game called Demonic. Demonic was first shown at E3 2005 and scheduled for a summer 2006 release. If this game looks familiar, it's because it was used in the 2006 movie Grandma's Boy. And for those of you who want to know what I look like, I was constantly compared to this guy in high school, so if you want a visual, here you go. The core gameplay centers around the player controlling a demon who possesses bodies that can be switched on the fly. The game would have no extra health, with the player having to jump from body to body to stay alive. And during climactic fights, the host body would shed into the demon himself. The game looked fairly impressive for the time, making use of lighting, physics, and destructible environments on the cutting edge of the console generation. A good chunk of the gameplay was shown, but the game was cancelled in 2006 after the publisher fell on hard times after the commercial failure of Advent Rising and the highly underrated Psychonauts. With how late in production Clive Barker's Demonic was cancelled, and how polished the demo looks, there is probably a large amount of playable game that is yet to leak. Just like how Konami seemingly abandoned the Silent Hill franchise, Square Enix hasn't done anything with the Chrono series since 1999, despite Chrono Trigger being among the greatest games ever made. Created by Nathan Lazar starting in the early 2000s, Chrono Resurrection was an attempted fan remake of the original Chrono Trigger. The project was highly ambitious starting as a full-on remake before eventually being scaled back to focus on 10 major sections from the game, realizing the team would only be able to fully remake the game with funding from Square Enix. Once the public got their first look at the game, the project began to attract serious hype across the gaming community, even from Square Enix themselves. Eventually leading the company to hit Chrono Resurrection with a cease and desist in 2004, effectively ending the project. 
Lazar would continue working in the games industry with his successful Football Heroes franchise, but it seems a playable build of what was completed on Chrono Resurrection will likely never be released to the public. Growing up, Diddy Kong Racing was one of my favorite games and started my love of games by Rare. Throughout the 90s and early 2000s, Rare could do no wrong, with massively successful titles in a number of genres, making some of the Super Nintendo and Nintendo 64's most beloved titles. That's why it came as such a shock to everyone, including the staff at Rare, when in 2002, Nintendo refused to purchase the company, instead being bought by Microsoft. This effectively ended one of gaming's greatest video game developers, as Microsoft continually sidelined the Rare team to ill-fitting projects like the Xbox Kinect games. Of the numerous games that were scrapped during the move was Donkey Kong Racing, the sequel to Diddy Kong Racing. Donkey Kong Racing was shown off for the first and only time at E3 2001 in a trailer that showed the game's new direction, switching out the carts of Diddy Kong Racing with the animals from the Donkey Kong Country franchise. Each animal was to have its own ability like being able to destroy objects or quickly maneuver. You were even able to be knocked off your animal, forcing the player to button mash to get back on. Based on the E3 trailer, the playable characters included characters from the Donkey Kong Country franchise and Taj, a non-playable character from Diddy Kong Racing, though I assume other characters from Diddy Kong Racing would have been playable too. Once Rare was bought by Microsoft, they were no longer allowed to use Nintendo characters, so Donkey Kong Racing was turned into an original IP called Saberman Stampede. The game started development as an animal-based racing title with the new protagonist Saberman. This version was rejected by Microsoft higher-ups, and the game eventually became an action platformer being described as Grand Theft Auto with animals. The project kept expanding with more animals, more scenery, more controls, and more techniques, but almost no story or objectives. The game was ultimately cancelled in 2005. But in 2008, 5 minutes of footage was uploaded online, and since numerous pieces of promo art have been leaked, but no playable builds have emerged from either Saberman Stampede or Donkey Kong Racing. I also have to mention, since I have you here, that the soundtrack for Diddy Kong Racing was shaped like Diddy, making it unplayable in most CD players. Like many of the games on this list, Interplay's Star Trek The Secret of Vulcan Fury folded under the weight of its own ambition. Scheduled for a 1997 release, Vulcan Fury was meant to be a continuation of the original series, fleshing out the backstory between the Vulcans and the Romulans, and was written by veteran Star Trek writer John Meredith Lucas and DC Fontana herself. In-game, you would control Kirk, McCoy, Sulu, Chekhov, Scotty, and even control Spock through a mind meld, with all the original voice actors reprising their role. Visually, the game was to make use of 3D animations using clay models and motion capture. And remember, this was all in the late 90s. The game's release date was pushed back for years before finally being cancelled in 1999 with the animators on the project still saying they had three years of development to go and only completed 5% of the game, even though it's been said that seven hours of motion capture was recorded. What does remain of the game has no chance of being found in any capacity. Former Interplay employee Chris Avalon stated that the game's assets, voice recording, and source code have all been lost. The unreleased game marks the last time the original Star Trek principal cast appeared in its entirety in a Star Trek production, due to the passing of Leonard McCoy actor DeForest Kelly in 1999. Everything that's left from the game has been archived at VulcanFury.com. While developing Vulcan Fury, Interplay released the original Fallout, a series with its fair share of lost and cancelled games. Following Fallout 2, the company began work on Fallout 3, codenamed Van Buren. The game was cancelled when Interplay shifted their attention to console games, moving the Fallout Van Buren staff to the also cancelled Fallout Brotherhood of Steel 2. All that surfaced from Fallout 3 is a playable tech demo and design documents. According to former Fallout developer John Dealey, Van Buren's engine was 95% complete, dialogue was 75% completed, 50% of the maps had been created, and the characters and monster designs had been modeled. Though we have a demo, the files from the full game have yet to appear online, though fan recreations have been made. But not all was lost from Fallout Van Buren's cancellation. Many members of the Van Buren team went on to found Obsidian Entertainment, who would go on to develop what is in my opinion the best Fallout game, Fallout New Vegas, where they got to use plot elements and locations first proposed in Van Buren. As you may already know, Bethesda Softworks now owns the Fallout franchise, obtaining full rights in 2007. Well, almost full rights. Under very specific guidelines, Interplay was allowed to make a Fallout MMO. 
These guidelines include the game being in development by April 4th, 2009, securing $30 million in funding, launching the game within four years of development, and having to pay Bethesda 12% of all sales and subscription fees. In 2009, Bethesda sued Interplay over the development of a Fallout MMO. In court, Interplay CEO Herb Kane presented the court with a 90-second clip of the game in action, proving the game was in full development. This 90-second clip has never emerged. Details on how far the project got into development are unclear, but the game was officially announced as Fallout Online amid legal battles in 2010 for a 2012 release, even allowing players to register for beta testing. The Fallout fan site, Duck and Cover, claimed in 2011 to have access to court documents stating that Interplay had already created 65,500 square miles of world to explore, starting zones for each player class had been completed, NPCs were able to exist in the environment, and the game's combat, leveling, and skill systems had all been tested and written. I personally could not find these court documents, but if found, I believe it would prove there is elements of Fallout Online that has lost media. In 2011, the case was settled out of court, with Bethesda having to pay Interplay $2 million for the rights to an online Fallout game. In 2018, we would finally see a Fallout MMO in the revolutionary, groundbreaking, perfect Fallout 76. When Guitar Hero came on the scene in 2005, it was a cultural phenomenon, and once it was bought by Activision, Activision did what they do best and cranked out game after game in the franchise, quickly leading to the rhythm genre as a whole becoming oversaturated. This culminated in the cancellation of Guitar Hero 7 and Activision putting the series on hold until 2015. Before its cancellation, Guitar Hero 7 was being developed by Vicarious Visions for a 2011 release and was desperately trying to innovate the franchise. A few of the major changes would have been a totally new art style, a new controller, and a dynamic approach to visuals. The new controller would have featured six buttons instead of five, and six strings instead of a strum bar. Each song was meant to have its own unique visuals, with their own camera cuts, venues, and depending on the player's success, the venue would change in a variety of ways. The new approach essentially made each song its own music video. According to an unnamed source with Kotaku, during the game's early development they only had a few songs to work with, so everything was based around Turn the Page by Metallica and I believe in a thing called Love by the Darkness. Upon seeing the game in action, the unknown source said, I didn't even like the song, but the demo gave me goosebumps. The game started to fall apart when the team realized that due to the franchise's dwindling success, they were forced to use songs that were cheaper to license like Sex and Candy and Closing Time, and even songs that had been used in multiple Guitar Hero games. Things only got worse when the new controller was found to be unresponsive and difficult to use. Once the team got about 80 songs, they realized they couldn't give every single song its own music video, so each song's unique feel was limited to small changes in camera angle, lighting, and minor set changes like additional graffiti. The project was cancelled halfway through development and the franchise was put on ice. No playable builds, demos, character designs, or controller specs have ever been leaked. We only have a few shots of the set list. Left 4 Dead 2 was released in 2009 by Valve Software and became a massive success for the company, selling over 11 million copies. Two DLCs were released for the game, The Passing and The Sacrifice in 2010, and two fan-made DLC games were released with Valve's approval, Coldstream and The Last Stand. However, there's another piece of DLC that was meant to tie in with the 2012 movie Cabin in the Woods that has never been released to the public. The team at Valve are working in collaboration with the team behind Cabin in the Woods, including director Andrew Goddard and writer Joss Whedon. Plans fell through after Cabin in the Woods was delayed from its original 2010 release date to 2012. Even though the game didn't work out, Valve still let their characters appear as easter eggs in Cabin in the Woods, and if it weren't for these easter eggs, we might never know the DLC existed, because the only reason we know the game was planned comes from a Reddit AMA with the film's director. When asked about the Left 4 Dead easter eggs, Goddard discussed the lost DLC for the first time. We were actually going to do a downloadable Left 4 Dead 2 expansion pack where you'd fight in the cabin world. By the way, the game was going to be amazing. We were going to be able to play in both the upstairs cabin in the woods world and the downstairs facility world with all the monsters. Believe me, I hate video games based on movies, they always suck. But porting cabin into Left 4 Dead felt like the right fit. It pains me that it didn't happen. There are currently no design documents, footage, demos, or even assets released for the game. Of 
course, we can't talk about Valve and lost video games without bringing up the Half-Life series. But we're not going to focus on the cancelled Half-Life 3, as there's no evidence of a playable build ever existing. Instead, we're going to focus on Half-Life Ravenholm. The game, also known as Half-Life Episode 4 and Return to Ravenholm, began sometime between 2007 and 2008 when Valve tasked Arcane Studios with making a standalone Half-Life 2 episode. The game's protagonist was Adrian Shepard from Half-Life Opposing Force, who would work alongside Father Grigory, the sole survivor of Ravenholm from Half-Life 2. The game would have made full use of Half-Life 2's physics engine and continued the franchise's use of experimental weaponry such as magnet guns, electric pulse guns, nail guns, and even a leaf blower type weapon that was never functionally coded into the game but would have allowed the player to double jump. All this playing off Father Grigory's penchant for traps and creative technology in Half-Life 2. The story for the game doesn't seem entirely fleshed out, but based on the working title, Return to Ravenholm, it suggests it would take place after Gordon Freeman's trip through Ravenholm, but this time would show Grigory experimenting with headcrab venom on himself, slowly mutating over the course of the game. Footage from Ravenholm was shown for the first time in Noclip's 2020 documentary on Arcane Studios. Based on the documentary footage, the game appears to be playable to some extent. Hopefully this will eventually lead to the game being released in some capacity so we can finally experience some sense of Arcane Studios' take on the Half-Life franchise. Gaming companies disrespecting their fans and abandoning beloved IPs isn't anything new. 1997's Mega Man Legends saw a fantastic jump from 2D to 3D where so many franchises have failed in the past. And this of course was followed up by 2000's superb Mega Man Legends 2 that proved the series was more than just a spin-off and could hold its own as a standalone franchise. Since the games were successful and Game 2 ended in a cliffhanger with Mega Man being trapped on the moon, a sequel seemed inevitable. But fans would have to wait a decade until Capcom and Mega Man creator Kenji Inafune would announce Mega Man Legends 3 for the Nintendo 3DS. In order to gauge public interest in the game, Capcom decided to release a 10 episode prologue to Mega Man Legends 3 as a launch title for the 3DS's eShop in 2011. Sadly, neither Mega Man Legends 3 or its prologue were ever released, with Capcom blaming the lack of fan interest in the game, despite a massive fan outcry for the game for over a decade. According to Chris Hoffman, a games journalist and one of the few people outside Capcom to ever play the 10 chapter prologue, said the game was completely finished, only need a little more polish, and doesn't understand why Capcom wouldn't just release the game to get some kind of return in their investment. Hoffman rated the game somewhere between a 7 or 8 out of 10, but stayed there with a surprising amount of content for a prologue, saying it was well worth the price. With the prologue being complete, I do have hope that it will be leaked someday, but honestly, I have little hope of a Mega Man Legends 3 ever being released. As of 2020, Mega Man is still stuck on the moon, with no prologue or full game in sight. Thank you so much for watching. There are so many more lost video games to talk about, so let me know what others you want to hear about and I just might make a part two. This is Mike with All Things Lost. See you soon.